Well, hey, everybody, it's Graham from TheRecordingRevolution.com, and uh, you're in for a treat today. I'm joined by a special guest. His name's Mike Sr. He's an audio engineer, educator. You might know him more for his uh, Mix Rescue column in Sound on Sound magazine. He's been doing that for a long time. We'll get into that in a while. He's also the author of this book, Mixing Secrets for the Small Studio, which I've recently recommended on the site, and you should pick up a copy. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. He's, uh, he's based in the UK, but now in Germany, it sounds. And um, yeah, he's, he's recording records, mixing records, and teaching how to make music all the time. So Mike, thanks for joining us on the, the website today. Great to be here. Um, so real quick, man, I always ask people, because I'm always interested, uh, what is it that got you into recording and mixing, and how did you kind of get to where you are doing this for a living as opposed to being a doctor or a lawyer or a school teacher or whatever else you could have been? <laughs> Probably a little differently than uh, a lot of people did. I was, I'm actually classically trained. Um, I, I went through the classical system, played violin, viola, piano, sang in choirs and things. Oh, wow. Um, and then it was only really when I was at university that I began to get interested in the whole recording thing. Um, you know, blew a student loan on a, on a multi-track, one of the first digi, digi multi-tracks that there came out. Go. Just started recording all comers, really. Um, just found that I was interested in it. Thought, yeah, no, actually, that's, that's something I'd really like to do. Um, and began getting work experience. Um, did the exactly the, the typical thing of sending out hundreds and hundreds of letters and following up with phone calls, and finally got to some person who said, "Oh, oh yeah, 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 our assistant let us down this week. Uh, just come in and make the tea." And then from there, just kept getting work experience. Then while I was uh, studying, um, went on to study down in London, did a master's in music IT, and that of course meant that I was based in London. So then I could go around all the different studios, picking up um, ex experience there and picking up work there as well. Awesome. Um, and then that meant that after I finished studying, I was able to get um, an in-house job then at a residential studio up in Milton Keynes. And it was there then that I was, you know, you know, in-house studios, uh, in-house engineers up to. I mean, basically, I was doing anything that anyone else wasn't doing, um, whether that was just, whether that was just making the tea if they brought their own engineers, yeah. or whether that was basically running the whole session and pretty much mixing the whole, recording the whole thing. Um, and then after that, just because when I was in Cambridge studying for my degree, I met the lady who's now my wife. Um, I decided that uh, I'd rather she weren't one of the, the typical studio widows. So <laughs> I jacked in and headed back to Cambridge, not realizing that Sound on Sound was based in Cambridge. Oh, cool. Um, and yeah, and just because I was looking for a job and saw the, the ad ca came up, it was a bit of, uh, bit of luck that just hit me. Um, then I ended up at Sound on Sound for like six years or so. Um, was working as a review editor there for a long time. Did more and more writing as I was as I was there. Um, did the commission the Studio SOS and the Mixed Rescue columns, and then went freelance from that. And then just ended up doing the the stuff that freelancers always do. You know, a bit of this, bit of that, really. Yeah. Um, ended up, of course, doing more writing. The the book then came from that. Did workshops and all sorts of other stuff as well. Sure. And kind of flowed from that really. Was um, the Mix Rescue column already in effect when you got the Sound on Sound, or did you start that? No, that was a that was a conscious decision of mine. It was something I pushed quite hard for, actually, because at the time, I was concerned that people reading the magazine would have a justifiable reason to doubt what we were saying. Uh -huh. I felt concerned that people would read an article in the magazine that said, oh, all right, you need to mix something like this, and I, as a reader, felt that I could ask the question, well, why? Why, why should I? Yeah. You know, or why should I believe what you're telling me? Either I want to see a, 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 a list of credits as long as your arm. Sure. And people who have a list of credits as long as your arm, they don't write magazine articles. Yeah. So either that or you've got to show me what, what you've achieved by doing what you, you say I should do. And then I can listen to it and think, well, if that's any good, then I'll, I'll believe what you're saying. And that was that was really why I pushed it, um, and it's still. Funnily enough, I was I was expecting once the ball had got rolling with it that other publications would actually have followed the lead. But for whatever reason, no one really took the bait, and so yeah. Samuel ended up being pretty much the only the only game in town from that perspective. That the only ones effectively who were putting their money where their mouth is and saying, "Well, we're telling you to mix this way, and this yeah. is what it sounds like we've done it." So, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. I mean, it's, for those of you that, it's funny. oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, it's funny because it works both ways because you get some people who actually come and say, "Well, no, I, I don't like your mix. I hate your mix." <laughs> yeah, that was. And, yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm, and the funny thing is, I'm, I'm actually happy that way too, because 
it means that I can then say to that person, well, that is the point of providing the audio examples. It means that you can read what I've written in that mix. Thankfully, it doesn't happen too often, but you can read what I did when I wrote the article and not do it. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. It tells you what not to do as well as what to do. You know, if you don't like the sound I'm making, then ignore me. Um, and uh, but but that's that's the that's the great thing about mixer rescue because of the audio files. That's just that's what makes it more than just a mix column. Um, oh, absolutely. And that was I mean, oh, and, for, and for those of you that are watching this that aren't familiar with Mix Rescue, or maybe you don't pick up sound on sound, you should. For one, um, it's it's the the best. It's one of the best, if not the best, magazines on the subject out there. But the Mix Rescue column in particular, where Mike will get you'll get a, a band sending you a song where they've either recorded it themselves, but they've almost tried to mix it themselves and aren't really pleased with the results and then what they they give Mike usually the all the audio tracks so that he can right. mix it from the ground up so he he doesn't record the tracks most of the time it's literally just okay well if I were going to mix your song here's what I would do he mixes it and then in the article he walks through you know okay with the drums he, here were some of the issues I found with the drums they had three snare mics you know and 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 they I just picked one you know or this was out of phase with this one or I really didn't think the room mics added anything and it's very logical of sort of your you know Mike's mindset of what he's doing and decisions he's making he talks about uh, plugins he's using there's there's images of what he's using you've used a couple different DAWs right I know are you mostly a Reaper guy yeah nowadays I use okay. mostly Reaper but um, I've used Cubase in the past and Logic I've done yeah. uh, mixes on hardware as well yeah, um, so I, again, I've parts. seen a bunch of different DAWs in there, but it's always teaching the concepts, and and I, I like it because it's very real. It's like this this was working well. I thought their guitar sounded great, so I didn't have to do much, but this was more of my challenge. And so he'll walk you through, and then at the end, you also get a little interview of the artist's reaction, which is really cool. They can they talk about man, I I was curious to hear. I get Mike's mix, and this is what he did better with it. And then the point is that you go online, and this is what Mike was getting at: is you can hear. We hear the before and hear the after, and it does sell not just your skill in particular, Mike, but it sells the magazine's credibility, the tips credibility, mm -hmm. and a lot of the tips in general, a lot of techniques that a lot of engineers use that if you haven't done it yourself, a before and after example is just, it's like magic. It seems like magic where you've got, well, that mix is bad, this mix is good, but really it's all these little teeny steps that Mike's been doing along the way. So. It is a unique column, and that is confusing to me, bro. That they haven't, no one else is doing this. But um, anyway, for those that aren't it's, familiar, you gotta you every month. Why do they it. do it because of the practicalities of doing it. It's well, it's all it's just uh, it's just it's just a big job to do. It's a big job. Yeah. Um, it, it's because you kind of have to mix, you kind of have to mix it, and then once you've mixed it, uh, often you don't know whether you can get to a mix that's any good. You know, you you start often starting with a situation where. Fundamentally, what they've sent you is broken in some way. They either they're mixing or something involved, right. and you just have to kind of keep plugging at it, and you're never quite sure when it's going to be finished. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then when it is finished, then you have to kind of go back through it a second time and go, well, uh, what did I do again? What was I thinking? You know, and you have to kind of deconstruct what you were thinking after you did it. That's so, to me uh, the yeah. hardest part because yeah, when you're mixing, you're not thinking about teaching. You're just trying to get the mix to sound good. But then you have to be like, oh yeah, what did I do? To fix that, yeah. I don't remember. It's funny though, actually, the discipline of having of doing mix rescue makes me more methodical and more rigorous now in the way I mix. I oh, often yeah. find myself thinking as I'm doing a mix rescue, how am I going to actually write about this when when I'm doing it? So actually, it makes me think more consciously about it. So, would you say that that's been the best thing that's come out of doing mix rescue, or or what what would be the best thing for you personally that you've gotten out of doing this for years now? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, when, whenever you have to talk about what you've done, I find it clarifies what you're thinking about. Mm, um, yes. Certainly the whole thing of the book came out of Mixed Rescue as a result of that, and also out of things where I'd done workshops, where I'd actually talked about the stuff I was doing before I'd kind of got the book idea together, just then talking through the way I was approaching things and getting people's feedback on them, that was what kind of began to lead me towards the idea of creating some kind of a systematic approach. Yeah. Uh, so Mike was... What was kind of, is that kind of the genesis of where that book came from? Like you, you either looked out and saw what books were already available and that you didn't find anything that was really written for the, the home or project studio or was it just you needed to That's write down your it. ideas? From, my, from, from the, that particular bit of teaching experience, it just hit me that 
I couldn't find anything that, that ticked the different boxes I wanted it to tick. It didn't come from that kind of obviously budget-restricted, environment-restricted situation that most people work with. You know, people in college students, they don't have any control over the setup usually, and usually it's a bit rubbish in some way or other. And they've got to be able to work within that. They've been working within a proper studio, and a lot of books are written from the perspective of, oh, well, if you if you haven't spent 10,000 pounds and go, you're not serious about it, and so we're not going to be relevant to you. And I just kind of thought that was, that was a pointless thing to say in this day and age. Um, the point is kind of perspective. I um, also felt that um, this kind of logic was missing. That if, a lot of the courses that gave you tips, gave you ideas, gave you, told you about what a compressor was, about what the controls were, but didn't actually tell you when you should use it, when right. you should use it, and, and why you should use it the way you use it. They, they tell you what the controls did, but that was it's like saying, all oh, right, well, there's the steering wheel, and that, that turns the front wheels, right. and, and there's the indicator, and that tells you whether you know. But then that's completely different than saying, all right, well, off the drive then. And, <laughs> And, and that, that's kind of what was missing. It's, it was that. It's the thought process that. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And so that's that's where it all came from, really. That yeah. was where that was where the genesis of the idea came from. Now, was that process for you, like, when you sat down and said, "Okay, I, I kind of want to put this together in a book." Did it almost write itself because you you knew what areas you needed to hit and you had created a like you said, a more methodical approach to mixing because you had to, or did you really have to sort of address what are the common issues of the day in a small studio? I think the thing is, it, it was it was such it's a it was a very long process writing it. Even though the actual writing of it was quite short, um, a lot of the ideas I kind of workshops well I, I mean i did workshops i, I talked about um I had people come and was talking about different concepts and ideas and mixing a lot of the ideas that ended up in the book in a more kind of structured form started off back then so there was a lot of kind of toing and froing of telling people these ideas and then say and then then ask, them asking me questions and querying what i was saying and so it was it was more a kind of an evolutionary thing than it was suddenly ah that's it i've got it it was it was yeah. there was no kind of eureka moment yeah. Um, in fact, the only eureka moment I think from the book was was while I was writing it, I didn't know what I think it was chapter sixteen was going to how that was going to work, and I kind of ended up at the end of chapter fifteen and thought, how am I going to write chapter sixteen? And then as I was writing, kind of, I just thought, oh, well, I'll just kind of write it, and and out it came. So that's cool. And I just the idea just came to me then and there. That's but, cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what I like about it, and this is one of the reasons why I recommended it, is um, it is methodical. And, and you talk about, even in the, in the beginning of the book, at, when you're talking about getting a sort of a static mix, and, and guys like Chris Lord Algae and a lot of guys tend to like to throw up their faders and just mix all at once and start sculpting a sound. And you even likened that process to being, sure, it's helpful for them, and obviously the results speak for themselves, but for a lot of people that are new to this, a step-by-step -step process actually can lead to success and learning for them easier and that's what's great about this book is that in general your whole book is step-by-step -step. I mean, you talk about monitoring at the very beginning make sure you can even hear what's happening in your DAW to you know considerations of when you pull up a mix and and this is something that I had been doing without even thinking about it when you put it to words it may, is exactly what has served me the most helpful is how you start a mix you talk about starting a mix with the most important part of the song, like maybe that final chorus, the biggest part, and, and really mixing the, as much as you can out of that section. It's a lot easier for the other sections to be smaller than to keep making a section bigger. Um, the, those type of things that you've lined up step by step, walking through EQ compression, all the way down to really putting the icing on the cake with effects, um, it, it's very methodical. And it's probably the way your your mind works too, um, but it it, <laughs> well, it helps it helps navigate it's the chaos just... of the home studio because there's nothing methodical for small studio people where we're you're, we're reading your, the magazine, we're getting tips. Maybe they're reading my website, they're getting tips. Maybe they're trying a new plugin, and they're just it's they're in the middle of chaos. How do and they're trying? Yeah. How do I get a great result out of this chaos? And this kind of gives you a straight line. Yeah, it's, it's it's because it's such a complex thing nowadays. Mixing there's there's so many things you can do and so much that's part of it. It's difficult to try and take on the whole subject at once, without breaking it down into little bits like that. 
Um, the thing is, the thing to, to, to say, and I kind of try and say this in the book as well, is that although the book itself is, is like you say, entirely pretty much step by step, it's about a step by step approach. I certainly don't mix like that. And the, the, the whole point of the step by step is that it is a, it is a learning construction. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you, you first learn about driving around your, your drive before you learn driving on the motorway. Yeah. You don't think about all the little things that you learn when you're learning to drive when you're actually driving. You just do it naturally. Yeah. And so when I'm mixing, I'm not thinking about following a, a set scheme of, of work, but it means that as I'm, I'm taking all the decisions that I talk about in the book, but I'm taking them all kind of concertina together, mm -hmm. you know, where I've spread it out into the step-by-step -step process. I'm kind of doing the whole mix through all these different steps. Whereas yeah. actually what, I, what I'm mixing, what most people do when they're mixing is that they start with one instrument or two instruments or they'll have a whole mix going and they'll do them all at once. And But trying to teach someone to do it all at once right from the outset is just a non-starter as far as I can see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just, just kind of why, if you watch like a professional mix engineer, it's not that helpful learning from a professional mix engineer that way because it seems random yeah. to look at it. So you're doing you're doing work you're working with bands you've done mix rescue for a number of years you've written the book um, if, if with all that experience you've had in particular your, your track is unique because you do work with a lot of small studio people that have this, the, these common problems that you're trying to unlock something for somebody so you're very aware of of what is typical out there in terms of the way people are recording mistakes they might be making whatever all of that information, which I think is helpful to our readers and viewers, what what is like a top three bits of advice that you, you could kind of give out of that knowledge base of typical things you see that could maybe help people watching this either make a better recording that would lead to a better mix or even do better mixing? What are maybe the top three things that you see as obvious trends that people should be doing to make things better? My my kind of view is that if you're going to spend money, the best place to spend it is to spend it on things that actually touch the air that either you're listening to or that is moving and that you're trying to record. So that means um, on the recording side, obviously your microphones, but the instruments, the acoustic treatment, the, the environment you're in, that's where the money really counts. You know, if you spend money there, it's going to do you five times the good than if you spend it on a great preamp, in, in my opinion. Similarly, on the listening side, there's there's no there's no point in spending masses of money on 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 software or interfaces or converters or whatever if you can't hear what you're doing, and you'll get five times as much benefit out of money spent on actual monitoring hardware, headphones, speakers, acoustic treatment any of that kind of stuff than you will from anything else. That's that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. I think people obsess about stuff that really is not the maximum bang for their buck. The maximum bang for your buck is getting the those bits that are in contact with the real air you're trying to deal with, getting those bits right and getting those bits as good as you can within your budget. I mean, that's one of the reasons why in Mixed Rescue I often try deliberately to say, well, no, I'm going to use freeware on this, or I'm just going to use the built-in plugins, because yeah. actually, if you've got the bits that are touching the air as good bits, then all the stuff that's in between is just a question of making it quicker and easier, pretty much. I mean, yes, some of the, the great kind of analog tools, and whatever, they do sound better, but the difference between the amount of better they sound and the, and the sound you can get if you can hear what you're doing with modest gear is small enough now that it's really not a deal breaker anymore. The stuff that you're recording with and the stuff you're listening with is the deal breaker. That's the stuff that shoots you in the foot if you can't, can't do it. But this is the reason why I'm so interested about um, doing this session notes thing that started in the, in the magazine is that that's the bit that I feel I've not been able to say enough in print is about how you can do that on the recording side. Right. As much as you do it in Mixed Rescue on the mixing side. And for people that aren't familiar, this is the, a, sort of a new segment in Sound on Sound where you're on location actually recording different artists of different genres in different acoustical challenging environments. Mm. Yeah, I mean, because I did one the other day where we managed to plan it in such a way that we recorded the, the bass and drums together as a, as, a, as a unit. And that recording that came straight out of the mics there was no processing or anything it came straight into kind of fairly budget stuff 
Um, and at the mix, I did almost nothing to it. I think I had a lot, like four bands of EQ in total across the bass and drums. Wow. Like a, one compressor, one gate, um, and I think a parallel compressor. It's just so important. It can completely make or break mix. And guitar sounds in particular, I think, that often um, show it up. You know, people will stick two, guitar, two um, mics on a guitar set on a guitar amp of some type and mix them together in a mix in a way that either it collapses in mono, for example, right. or it just sounds a bit kind of spongy. I mean, how often have you heard demos with spongy guitars? Yeah. That's pretty much the sound of demo guitars. Yeah. And the difference between a spongy guitar and one that doesn't sound spongy is basically phase, pretty much. Yeah. You know, you adjust the phase and all of a sudden it locks in and you get something that actually seems to really sit there almost in front of your speaker rather than kind of disappearing somewhere and you're forever trying to turn it up in the mix. Yeah, um, well, and that's yeah, a lot of people, I think, especially me, when I started years ago playing around with audio and no one's taught you about phase, you, you, you make things harder on yourself when you're trying to EQ guitars that are out of phase and you're like, I cannot get this to sound good and it's you feel defeated, but actually it's not really you. Maybe you recorded it well if they're in phase and you have a much better starting point, but it's sort of a mystery if you're not really knowing about it, but it's a simple thing for a lot of people to fix. It's certainly the thing that most commonly undermines drum sounds yes. on, uh, on budget recordings. And also um, monocompatibility is the other thing. Um, phase problems with monocompatibility, that, that's often a problem. Or with the bass, that's another thing. It often undermines the bass yeah. reproduction on, on, the, on the thing. Um, <coughs> so, I mean, if you, can, if you can get on top of phase. Funnily enough, you were saying the things that I've learned as I've done more and more mixed rescues. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that I do more and more work with phase over time and less and less work with anything else. <laughs> Interesting. But I actually find that I get more, better results quicker with much less processing just by concentrating more and more on phase earlier on. Oh, that's great. So that'd be, that would definitely be the second big thing. Um, the third one probably, well, I mean, the biggest thing that you can do from the perspective of um, mixing on a budget is referencing. And it's something that... Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of preaching to the converted in some respects. If, uh, in fact, I was I was did a, um, a seminar at the AS show, uh, they the project, uh, and you know, I asked two sessions that they had there. You know, who reference their, their mixes? They do it. Most people's hands went up. People know it's a good idea, but in my experience, most people don't actually get anything like full value out of it. Interesting. Usually, because they choose the wrong tracks. Huh. They they don't they they don't exercise any kind of critical evaluation when they're when they're thinking. They don't like take ten albums and narrow it down to three. Just that process of taking or ten, ten tracks even and narrowing it down to three that immediately probably will increase your mixing quality by about twenty percent. Wow. <clears throat> Similarly, the, the the choice of reference tracks because they're good music because you really like the track. Right. In fact. Just because, I mean, this is about uh, eight years ago, I went through my entire record collection and, like, anally <laughs> compared every bloody track against every other one. And the, one of the things I really learned from that was that often the best sounding cut on an album is not single. Hmm. It's not the track that you really like. Yeah, and you talk it's about that in the book, that, that look for maybe the other songs on the album that are better yeah. sonically. And that's that's a that's a common mistake I find. Also, people don't select their references rigorously enough. I mean, you can see all the speakers I have um, behind me, and, and yeah. you know, if you're going to have your references, and they're actually useful to you. The, one of the points of them is to tell you what your mix is going to sound like out in the wide world. And the yeah. best way to do that is to have selected your references on as many different speaker systems as you can, because then even if you're not hearing. Um, even if you're in a, in a room that you're not used to, you can put up your references and you have an, an instinct immediately of what the room is doing to your sound yeah. and how you mix kind of around the sound of the room, through the sound of the room rather than being misled by it. I mean, if, if people just referenced, it gets around so many problems with um, kind of monitoring frequency response. Whatever. People are always kind of yeah. worried about having the flattest frequency response on their, on their speakers right. and everything. That doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. People are fixing fantastic mixes on all sorts of different speakers and yeah. none of them are flat. Yeah. The point is, 
they know what they sound like. They and the way like. they know what they sound like is that they've built up this experience of what great productions sound like on those speakers. Yeah. So, yeah, if you reference, that's, that's about the best money you can spend. You can spend and you've probably already spent it because yeah. your record's already set <laughs> on your shelf. That's genius. That's a tweet right there. That's awesome. Um, I I 100% agree. Referencing is a painful process initially because it makes you feel like your mixes are horrible compared to the ones that you revere. But it is a worthwhile. It doesn't process. get any. Don't worry. It doesn't get any better. It's still a painful process. Yeah, okay, that's that's good. Um, I went to I went to the Twitterverse to kind of get online and see if anybody had any questions for you since I was about to do this interview. Yeah. So I know this isn't live for people watching this, but um, uh, one of our uh, followers Thomas said uh, um, he wanted to know it kind of what we just talked about the top five mixed rescue mistakes and homegrown productions and you kind of touched on that like the phase issues maybe they didn't spend enough time in the recording end um, maybe they yeah. didn't reference um, any other what would be one other maybe on the recording end of things tips you could give the mistakes you see on the recording end of things on the recording end of things uh I mean, as the kind of recording end of thing, I, I don't see it more in the perspective of a track. Yeah. Usually, the problems I see are that people aren't taking an active decision about the way they want their record to sound. So I'll get a bunch of tracks. I mean, the, the classic example is I get um, like uh, an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar or something that's got like three or four different mic signals, and you listen to each one of these mic mic, mic signals one after another, and none of them sound any good. And you think, well, why did you put up four mic signals? I, I, four mics. I mean, yeah. you basically you've not decided on the sound you want and gone and got it. You've just slung some mics up and tried to give yourself lots of options without actually making a decision. You've got to make decisions, particularly in the home studio. You don't have the same leeway that people had in the 80s of hours of studio time and ridiculous setups to, yeah. to uh, yeah. ages of time and, and, and manpower. You've got to take decisions and take them straight away. Take them early. Get making decisions as soon as you can the sooner you can make decisions the quicker the whole thing goes <laughs> makes sense that makes that's, sense yeah, that's, that's, that's certainly one thing I would say on the recording side on the mixing side people doing things not for a reason is usually the biggest problem mm. so doing things because they think they should do them um, doing things because they sound better in solo rather than thinking about how the mix is put together. I mean, yeah. that's a common thing, kind of too much EQ boost and all that kind of thing. Um, also with, with effects, people just putting on effects because they think they should be there. Um, I'll, I'll often do mixes which have almost no effects at all. Um, you just, you, you have to listen to what's there and think, well, <coughs> does something not blend? Do I need more tail on something? Do I, yeah. do I want to give something some width? Do I want to, it's, 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 you've got to have a reason for putting those effects in. Otherwise you just end up with a bunch of stuff you don't need. Yeah. You can't hear that you actually want to hear. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's probably plaguing a lot of amateur mixers or new mixers because, again, they, they it takes time to develop a taste to know why you'd want to do something. Or maybe they don't know what the problems are, so they're just tweaking around. But I, I think you're right. A lot of people use effects because they're there, mm. and they don't know why sometimes. And that, that makes a lot of sense. So commit to a sound early on. What a concept when you're recording. Yeah. And then use an effect. Yeah you know why you're doing something in the mixing phase and if you don't know why then don't yeah. do it actually it was just interesting because i um spoke to a guy called al schmidt at the uh, aes show um i don't know if you know al schmidt but he's i think he's the audio engineer who's won the most grammys he's won about like 21 grammys yeah i don't know him personally but yes i know oh him. yeah <laughs> but he was on, he was on a panel with these five other yeah. grammy winning engineers and someone asked the question um i think the question was um how should you best use EQ? And Al Schmidt's answer was, don't. <laughs> and, he, and, and he came out and said, well, actually, probably for the majority of my mixes, I don't use any EQ at all. Wow. And if you just think about that, and if you listen to any of his productions and you think, this man is using no EQ at all, it puts a lot of your preconceptions about what a record production should be about into perspective. Wow. And I think it, that is something that, uh, that is so relevant to, to Project Studios now because the point about the way he records is that he thinks about what sound he wants right then and there and he doesn't have to do any work with it afterwards because it's all coming out of the microphones. 
and it's, it makes the session so much better as well. This is something I find, is that if you work in that kind of way, you put the mics up, you get the sound, the people play the thing and come into the control room, and you hit play and you play them the record. Yeah. And suddenly they're like, we've just been playing a record. And the, 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 the kind of positive feedback you get, the kind of feedback loop you get then, is then they go, crumbs, we're playing a record. First of all, I'd better really up my game. Secondly, wow, we're playing a record. They go back and they do an even better take second time. Also, they'll think, well, I can actually hear myself within the concept, within the context of the record. And certainly any musician worth a name will listen and go, well, you know what? That, that, that third note in the lick, I, I can't hear that. And they'll go back and play it different. They'll mix it for you in the, in the live room. Wow. wow and that, that makes perfect sense. Stuff. It's like a psychological uh, yeah. benefit. And actually, it will enhance the performance and therefore even benefit the recording that much more but if you can think in terms of actually not using any processing at all that that is absolutely the way to approach recording you shouldn't actually have to process that much if you're yeah if you're if you're actually serious about getting the sound at source yeah yeah that doesn't seem to be a popular tip though we give that out a lot and people no. are like no just tell me what plugin preset to use and and then i'll be good <laughs> so but <laughs> It's so refreshing to hear, and, and, and again, I, I hope to encourage readers as well and people watching this as well that that's where the fun of making music is as well, where you're actually capturing something, and like you said, it, you described that energy in the actual studio that only feeds why are you doing this, otherwise you're cleaning up a mess all the time, your own mess yeah. a lot of times, and it's, that's not fun. <laughs> um, great, great tips. One other question came in, any new books planned? For Mike Senior in the future. New books, it's, oh, yeah, it's tricky at the moment. I, I, my, my main kind of research area at the moment, and my main kind of interest, is like I said on the on the other side of the of the of the recording system. I mean, so far I've been looking at the back end of it, the mixing thing. You know, taking your recordings that you've done and chucking them out towards the speakers in a way that sounds like a like a record. Yeah. But I think the other real link in the chain of the whole thing is looking at the front end of it. And thinking, well, actually, a lot of the stuff that you have to deal with when you're mixing is just not necessary to have to deal with. Yeah, you shouldn't have to do a lot of the things that I talk about in the book if you just take quite common sense approaches when you're recording. Yeah. Um, so maybe a recording book then is that the idea? I think that kind of area is probably the area I'm going to go into. Um, yeah. It's possible that I might I might do something to link in with the uh, mix review column as well this thing where i listen to commercial productions and oh, yeah. um write kind of ideas about the way the productions worked and the things that they're, that, that they're doing and how i think that works um that's also a, a kind of an area that seems to be quite popular so i might come to that a bit further very cool well, we, we either way whenever you do work on one let let me know man get me in touch and let me know that you're working on something and uh <laughs> love to get get our hands on and read it and of course share it with everyone that's a part of the recording revolution here yeah, definitely. Mike, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for taking the time, not only for what you get, you guys do with Sound on Sound, um, the, the, the idea and the dedication to really find relevant training and tips for people and, and, uh, and then methodically kind of put a lot of that into the book. Again, if everyone, anyone's watching that hasn't heard it already, there's a lot of books on audio out there, but get Mixing Secrets to the Home Studio, small studio, because it's not just home studios. It's one of the most complete um, but approachable books out there. And, uh, and Mike, just you're doing great work. I appreciate you as another person educating and training and uh, love the magazine as well. So keep up the great work. And thanks for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Keep, keep up the great work on the, on the videos as well. I've been seeing some great things coming on the side. Oh, thanks. I try, man. Well, there's nothing new under the sun, but we're all trying to help and uh, and make yeah. better music in the studios and make better music for the world to well, hear. We've got, so. to, we've, got to, we've got to support each other is the main thing. You know, there, there are there are only a few people who actually really are trying to push forward this kind of development of, of, of mixing teaching now yeah. because so many of the kind of the, the, the centers of learning, these big studios and these big kind of creative complex, complexes that don't exist anymore and people are now having to connect in different ways. Right. No, it's good, good to, to keep, keep, the, keep the ball rolling and keep kind of spreading the love, keep you know, picking up tips from other people. I mean, I'm, I'm learning the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. And I learn, and again, I learn from your book and your columns, and I look forward to the magazine every month. It's the only one I actually subscribe to, so that tells you something. Oh, right. But yeah, right. I appreciate it. 
And, uh, and hopefully I will do this again sometime, man, and keep me in the loop about the things you're working on. And if there's yeah. any books in the pipeline, we'd love to put them out here on the site as well. Definitely. Thanks a lot, Mike. Take care, man.